Um, I'm Matt Stump. I'm the uh, back-end architect for Kissmetrics. Um, I'm also a DSDX MVP and the author of libcql, the C++ uh, native protocol driver for Cassandra. Um, I work for Kissmetrics. Um, just a little bit about what we do because that will help inform you know, why we went the path that we went. Um, we're an analytics company. Uh, similar to Google Analytics, we put uh, JavaScript on your website um, or you can feed us you know, events from your back-end system. And um, Google Analytics will tell you, you know, what happened. You know, there's a page view from North America and 10% you know, come from like, IE users or something like that. But we take a different approach. We take a person-centric approach. So um, uh, some of the stuff that our customers are interested in um, all have to do with people. Um, where Google Analytics will tell you, you know, 10% of your traffic comes from um, uh, IE users, we can tell you that, oh, that 10% actually represents 90% of your revenue. Um, so you can't just deprecate that browser. Or we can tell you um, uh, Twitter ads may convert at a lower rate, but those users actually sign up for higher uh, uh, monthly reoccurring um, plans. And so you want to spend more of your money there. Or green, you know, we do all the standard A, B stuff, but really we want to help our customers dive into the data and, and find the difficult to uncover conclusions that can really transform your business to help you run more optimized, more lean, um, and um, essentially build a better product. So um, we deal with hundreds of millions of events per day. Some of those are page views. Some of those are, oh, this person bought this. Uh, product and that represents 10% of, or $10 worth of revenue. Um, uh, but, um, and, we, and we're using um, a custom built MapReduce framework written in Ruby to do that. Um, and as bad as that sounds, it's actually uh, pretty performant because you know, we're able to uh, return results and render pages in real time and we're doing it across hundreds of terabytes of data. Um, uh, but we've gotten to the point where it's really starting to hold back business. And so um, they brought me on to figure out how can we switch to a real-time interface where we can do really complex queries and return results in less than 500 milliseconds um, so that um, I can render a page. Basically, everything was done in mind of being able to consume the data from multiple Facebooks um, and then run a regex query across the hundreds of terabytes of data and then have a response returned in 500 milliseconds. So um, uh, we think we've come up with, with a solution and I'll tell you basically how we arrived at it, how it works, um, and uh, where you can find it because everything has been done open source. Um, so to understand um, uh, why we went the way we went, you have to sort of understand how queries work in Cassandra now. Um, Cassandra is really a very fancy distributed hash table. Um, and the, uh, the primary key is your row key. So that's um, the, the hash of that row key determines which node a piece of data gets placed on. And then when you get to the row, really each, um, each row is a sorted set of um, of columns and uh, values. Um, so you're really limited by, uh, uh, on the row key, the, the, uh, just the going directly to the hash, so the quality of the hash. And then within um, uh, a given uh, row, you're limited to uh, slicing on um, the uh, columns based off of the order of the, uh, the column keys. Um, and so you can get a lot of functionality out of that. Like for instance, this is how um, uh, secondary indexes are implemented. It's basically, you, I've taken my zip code uh, from this previous slide, I've made that my row key, and then I take my primary key and I stick that as each column in a very wide row. So you can get interesting behavior, but this is limited because you know, I'm storing these massive sets of strings. Um, you know, they don't deal with high cardinality data pretty well. 
The query planner is really limited because these indexes are actually distributed across the clusters, so you can't do things like unions of different indexes very efficiently. Um, uh, and it only works for some data types. It doesn't work for counters, uh, things like that. And uh, range queries involve broadcasting the query out to the entire cluster, and you have to gather results from every single cluster node, stitch that back into a really big um, uh, uh, candidate list to return 20 results to render a page. And so it's just not really feasible to use it in a uh, query language like SQL where I want multiple indexes, multiple where clauses. Um, uh, I want to do regex search and, um, and range searches and all that stuff. It just doesn't work. So what I want is I want high cardinality data. So, you know, every single zip code, you know, in the U.S. is one example. But I want to be able to um, uh, index every possible counter value for a 128-bit counter. Or I want to be able to um, index every single tweet that's ever happened and be able to search by a regular expression. Um, um, like I... I uh, like I said, all results have to return in less than 500 milliseconds, and that's for billions of rows. Um, and I want subfield searching with regular expressions, so if I index a tweet, I want to be able to do the regex on the tweet. Um, and I want range queries. So range queries for us typically mean things like, I want all users in the past 30 days that have uh, uh, generated revenue more than $10,000 and came from, you know, ad campaign A. Um, you know, things like that. Um, so I can really, you know, that way I can do things like target um, uh, UI experiments just towards those users or target UI experiments just to Twitter users and all sorts of other interesting stuff um, that you can't do with existing systems. So um, s did a lot of research, um, tried to figure out, you know, what do other databases do? I mean, this, this has to be a solved problem. And really it comes down to bitmap um, and bit slice indexes. Um, and I'll go through and you know, try and teach you as best as I can how they all work. Um, how they all work. Um, so, uh, okay. So this is your standard inverted index um, uh, where I have a, uh, uh, an index name and I store the, you know, which users actually hit um, you know, which users are using 94110 as their zip code, um, and in this instance, just C star. So um, in order to, to make this a more tractable problem, a single machine problem, what you want to do is you want to encode that as um, uh, a bit array. And so it's basically as small as I can get, and I'll get into how this works. So for uh, 94110, I've run C star's uh, ID through a hash function, and out of, out of that hash function comes uh, the number four. And so I set the fourth bit to one, meaning row four um, has, um, is, has a value of 94110 as the zip code. Um, does that all make sense? Nod your head, please. All right, cool. Um, uh, and so basically, as long as I have unique row IDs that can be run through some hash function or be reduced to an integer, that means I can use bit slices to represent you know, any yes, no clause. So did they hit this event? Are they in zip code 94110? All that sort of stuff can be answered through a single, single dimension bit map, or uh, uh, bit slice, or bit vector, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, if I want to select all users that come from these two zip codes, well, it's just a union of those two arrays. And so I just go through with a bitwise operation and I just combine the two and out pops a, a result or an intermediate result that contains the, the set ones from both of those previous bit vectors. So if I want to select all users where zip code equals 94110 or zip code 94112, you know, it's just the combination of those two, and you can see the, the ones from both are represented in the, in the bottom. Um, if I want to do a, um, uh, an intersection, like an AND clause, um, 
Uh, so um, I want to find all users that have triggered event one or event two, oh, event one and event two, then I do the intersection. So the value, the, the, the ones have to be lined up in both of those bit vectors. Um, so right there I've got the basis of Boolean algebra. I've got my AND, my, got my OR, I've got my XOR. And so really I just have to figure out more creative ways of encoding the same problems in these bits, bit vectors, bit slices, whatever you want to call them. Um, so how do I encode more interesting values into a bitmap index? Well, you had more bitmaps, of course. Um, so the, um, really what you end up doing is you create these two-dimensional arrays. So um, I'll have um, uh, multiple bit slices, all for the same field, and then for each possible value, let's say I'm indexing counters, then I'll do one uh, array for the value one and one array for the value two. So if you're present in um, uh, the array for value one, that means your counter value is set to one. If you're present in counter value two, uh, in the, the bit array for counter value two, that means your counter value is two. And so that way I can do range queries. So give me all users that have triggered this event less than five. So I'll just take the first five uh, uh, bitmap indexes do a union across them, and that gives me all users that have triggered event uh, have triggered this event uh, zero through five times, um, and that uh, uh, yeah. 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 Um, it's, it can be very big, and I'll get into some um, optimizations on how you get that down, and you only end up needing to store the data in order to represent this. Because I, you know, if you assume that um, each of these is a, can represent 128 bits of, of data, which is ginormous, um, uh, even for 64 bits or 32 bit, you know, it's ginormous. 32 bit could be, you know, four gigs, um, and so if you have just a bunch of four gig arrays sitting around with one bit of data and you know a bunch of zeros, that's not very efficient. I haven't solved my problem. I haven't made this into a one machine problem. Um, um, and um, if you read through the papers, pretty much every single paper is dealing with that exact same problem. And there's a, different, a number of different approaches and I'll, um, I'll tell you the one that I took. Um, so um, how do we in do indexing on stuff like text? Um, because that's sort of the holy grail, my regex expression across my 110 terabytes of data. Um, you break it into trigrams. So um, trigrams, um, if you've used solar or if you've used uh, regex search in Postgres, you'll be familiar with this. Basically, you take a, um, sometimes it's referred to as n-gram, um, but you take a string and you break it into three character chunks. Um, depending on how you want it indexed, you know, for case insensitive versus um, uh, case sensitive, um, you'll run it through like a, you know, run it to lower case first. It's really up to you. But I take it into these three gram chunks, and then I encode it as integers. Um, and if you um, if you happen to memorize the ASCII byte chart, um, you'll see that the uh, the for this is my T, this is my H, and this is my um, I for my first trigram. And so really I've just taken the, the Unicode byte values and I've uh, stored it into 128-bit int. Um, and the reason why I'm using 128-bit bit ints is because um, Unicode characters have a maximum length of four bytes, which means I can stuff four of them into a 128-bit integer, but I can't do that for a 64-bit. Um, and we um, we're a global company, like I assume all of you are, um, so we want to support full Unicode. Um, so I take my, uh, my trigrams and I'll create a two-dimensional uh, bit slice index out of it. Same idea as the range queries with the events um, from the previous slides, but I'll have one, um, one uh, bit array for each trigram. Um, so I... Uh, uh, this is all for one field, 
the, um, the second column is the individual value of each trigram, and the, uh, the slice is who has a document with that trigram present. From there, um, I get, yeah. Sure. Um, I'll get into that, but, um, uh, and that's really tightly integrated with my uh, performance solution that he mentioned, uh, that he asked about earlier. Um, but um, uh, these can be really large, and so you can't stick it into an individual column, um, because individual columns I, um, have a limit of, I think, 256 megs. And so each of these slices could potentially be a bit bigger than that, dependent on the distribution of your data. So if you had, um, five million users with a counter value of one, um, or like say four billion users with a count, uh, counter value of one, that's going to exceed the value of your column. That's going to be 512 meg. Um, um, if you had a lot, uh, if you had a very wide distribution of data, then you could have um, one or two users in each bit slice index, and so each bit slice would be much smaller. So it really has to come down with the distribution of the data that you're trying to index. So um, if I want to do a regex search, um, then what I do is I'll take that same uh, regular, I'll, I'll, I'll break this into a, a, a series of Boolean clauses that need to be matched in order for the regex to be satisfied. So for this example, um, I have two trigrams that it needs to match in order for the regex to be satisfied. THI and ING. And so what I do is I convert those to the, the um, hex representation. I'll take my um, bit slice indexes for those two trigrams. I'll perform the intersection, which means that, well, they have to exist in both of these indexes for the regex to be satisfied. That gives me an intermediate result, which I refer to as my candidate list. Yeah. Yep. Um, so if you look back at this trigram, really, oh, it's really a range. So really, as long as, um, oh, sorry, that's not actually what I wanted to show. So I only need to come down to the candidate list, and um, the candidate list um, uh, gives me a, a list of documents that have a probability of matching the regular expression, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, and then from that, I need to actually run the regular expression. But the nice thing is that we're, for the most part, we're not ever asking for, give me all documents right now that, have, that potentially match this regex. We're returning 20 results at a time. And so what we do is I'll, I'll com collapse the indexes down to my final candidate list, and then I'll look at the first 20 records. And then um, uh, and I'll look at the, the, um, the actual text for those 20 records and run it through an actual regex engine to verify that it matches. If, it ma if all 20 match, then I just return those 20 results. If um, one of those doesn't match, then I discard it and I get the next item out of the bitmap array and then I return that to the customer. And so it's really, it's taken a problem that seems intractable and it's really collapsed it down, given me a very manageable set of documents to look at, and um, uh, from there I can you know, run regex on a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall results I need to return. And this is, um, uh, last year um, uh, there was a paper by the, um, the, the guy who wrote Google Code Search. This is exactly, exactly how Google Code Search works. Um, and so one of the examples that they give is, all right, so we're gonna, we want to run a grep across um, the, the Linux kernel source code. Um, if you just ran the raw regex, I'm checking 32,000 different files. But if I use the trigram index, I'm checking like 20 files. And so it's more than 100x performance improvement over the naive, let's just do a linear scan over all of the data really, um, and that's what we're trying to avoid. If we wanted to do linear scans over the, all the data, we would just go with Hadoop or Dremel or, or any of those other ones. Really, it's like, 
and there's just no way you can make that fast enough because you know you can't scan through that much data quickly enough to return a, a web result. The trick is to take these seemingly intractable problems and make them single, the size of a single machine. And from that, you get raw CPU performance. I mean, like the implementation that I'm working with, um, I'm only limited by the band, the memory bandwidth of the machine performing the query. So on my laptop, I get 16 gigabytes per second of raw query throughput. On server hardware, I get 40 gigabytes per second of raw server throughput. And that's just, you know, answering it for, you know, one user on a given shard or product. Um, and I have multiple replicas sitting around, so I can, you know, answer three of those for any given consumer, and then um, this whole solution scales linearly. So you just take this very large problem, you break it down into smaller and smaller parts, and so you get the smallest thing that you can actively work on. Um, so that was great for uh, regexes that, um, that easily break down into trigrams. So how does it work for um, this case where I've got TH um, and ING. So the TH isn't a complete trigram, um, uh, and really it could match, you know, uh, in the case of English, uh, 26 possible trigrams. So um, I, I, what I do is I break it into the Boolean clauses again. I notice that that's not a complete trigram. And I break this into a range query. So I say, give me all trigrams that match TH plus byte zero all the way to TH plus zero XFF. And so it involves getting more right, um, uh, bitmap indexes, but again, bitmap indexes are very fast. It's running at the speed of hardware. Um, uh, uh, it's not a big deal. And it's gonna be, you know, compared to your network latency for returning results and stuff like that, it's infinitesimally small. Um, uh, so here you can see in the example, I've gotten, um, the, the ING clause can be answered by the one uh, uh, bitmap uh, in uh, red, and then the THI, because I only have two trigrams that possibly satisfy that, are fetched by um, the uh, bitmap indexes highlighted in the very obnoxious purple. Um, so yes, it really is tacos all the way down. And the reason why it's tacos all the way down is because if you Google turtles all the way down, this is what you get. I, I like the tacos. Um, <laughs> So implementation, um, really scary wireframe diagram. Um, but basically, events come into the system. We've got Nginx um, uh, uh, sitting at the, um, the edge. Um, uh, that writes out to a log file just for redundancy purposes. Um, and it goes off to an Erlang process called Glutton. Um, Glutton has a local queue um, that's level DV, DB, and it just its only real purpose is to, to spool events off um, into a distributed queue. Um, uh, we were originally targeting Kafka, but it looks like we're probably gonna end up going with NSQ. Uh, I talked to my ops guy this morning and he's in love with it already. Um, so, um, oh, and Glutton, um, it's very like lightweight Erlang process. Um, it's actually faster than Nginx. It's capable of full, a single machine, um, is capable of handling in excess of 200,000 events per second. Um, uh, it's actually, it's, I'm not sure how fast it'll go because all of my load testing tools broke um, before they, they were able to stress it far enough. Um, so I'm happy with that. Um, it goes into the, um, the distributed queue and then we've got another Erlang process that um, pulls items out of the queue uh, to be indexed. The, um, the way that it works is that, because we consume events from multiple different sources, not only the ones that we generate as part of our JavaScript or our app integration APIs, we've got third party plugins for um, things like Stripe, MailChimp, um, Recurly, um, you know, it's really, that, that list can be N length. Um, so I didn't wanna have to um, uh, go in and muck with C++ every single time somebody wanted to add a new customer integration. So um, all events have types, and um, those get dispatched to a Lua script. So we've embedded Lua, so if you need to add another event type, you just add another Lua script and you register it with the system, and um, the Lua script will take the, um, the event, 
uh, convert it to the canonical format and tell the system what fields it wants indexed. It'll just index them and then um, it writes it through to Cassandra and Cassandra is the eventual data store. Everything's pluggable here so if you wanted to swap out the scripting engine with say V8, that's doable. If you want to swap out the, um, uh, the um, final persistence mechanism for like React or, or what have you, HBase, it's fine, I don't care. Um, it's just there as long as you implement a standard set of interfaces. Um, you know, God help you if you wanted to, you could even do MongoDB. Um, so, um, uh, is there anything else there? Oh, um, we're also um, on the, this isn't done yet, but the, um, uh, we also allow Lua scripts for filtering of columns that we return in results. So the, um, you can say um, only return columns that have a value greater than 10 or something like that. So you can actually write scripts that filter out um, the, um, the columns that return to you. So we're not returning, you know, and just like, you know, give me this list of columns or something like that. You can really dive deep into the data um, and get as detailed as you want. Um, so how do I store the data? Um, Basically, um, the way that it works in Cassandra, I do um, the field that I'm indexing and then underscore the, um, uh, the value for the bit slice index. So if, um, uh, the, the bit slice that represents 0, 0 has its own row. The bit slice that, ha that represents value 0, 1, um, it has its own row and that's 0, 1. And then within each bit slice, I only want to store the, the values that are set. Um, I don't want to store massive amounts of zeros. And so the columns are actually offsets. And so I store the index in chunks of um, n bytes. Right now, n is set to 256. So um, if I have five bits sit at the set at the beginning, and then five gigabytes of zeros, and then another bit set, well, I only have to store 512 bytes. Um, um, that's the approach that I took. Um, uh, the other approaches, I can get into them because I spent way too much time reading papers, but um, they're using compression. So if, um, like Dru the Druid project, um, that's um, another database that's capable, that uses bitmap indexes, is capable of doing lots of really cool things. Um, but they're using compression. Um, and the way that bitmap compression works is that um, it's just run length uh, compression. So I'll store, um, let's say the first five bits are set, and then I've got five gigs of zeros. Well, they'll set the first five bits, and then they'll store a little header essentially that says the next five gigabytes are zeros and then the next you know whatever couple of bits are actually literal bits of stored values the problem with that is that um, you don't you can't seek directly to the position that you want and so I always have to read through the entire bit slice in order to figure out all right what values are actually set um, or heaven forbid I want to change something, I have to seek to that position in the array, set the bit, and then re-encode the bits that, became, uh, that came before it. Um, uh, and so a lot involves lots of memory copies and things like that. Um, there are other things like um, range encoding. Um, uh, there, you can sort of store the stuff as a giant skip list so that, you know, um, so, uh, like I can skip to different segments and possibly do compression. Of that. That's too complicated for a first version. Um, so uh, I just decided to go with what's simple and what works. Um, and um, I think this will solve most of the problems. And if it doesn't, well, we can do other things. Also, because it's in Cassandra, we're using compression. Um, um, I'm using my libcql um, uh, version of the driver, so I'm using snappy compression there. This um, uh, level DB is using snap, uh, snappy compression, so this is all compressed on disk of the individual uh, query nodes. So I'm not too worried about it. Um, also, like, 
you know, a lot of the, uh, the compression primitives are actually implemented in CPU hardware nowadays, so it's actually pretty damn cheap to, to decompress something. Um, this is the query language, giant wall of text, um, but I just want, I, I felt I should give you an example of what the query language looks like. It's Lispy, uses S expressions, S expressions because I like Lisp, but um, uh, it's um, uh, just a DSL implemented in C++ using the, the spirit parser from Boost. Um, uh, the, the core, um, the most basic operation in the query language is a slice. Basically, I want to create, I want to compress a, um, uh, uh, a two-dimensional bitmap index um, into a single one-dimensional slice, which gives me, you know, what rows are hit. So if I just want, like, all users that have ever triggered the visit event, well, then I just, I compress the entire um, two-dimensional index into one bit slice, um, and I just name my index. If I want to um, uh, get all users that have visited in 2013, well then I've got, I'm using, I'm doing aggregation um, um, on date time buckets uh, like I assume a lot of you are. So like, you know, I'll have visit for the total visit count. I'll have visit underscore 2013 for visits in 2013. I'll have the same thing for month and for day. And you can go down to hour and minute, no big deal. It's free. Um, uh, or basically free. Um, so I'll do, um, I'll just slice on the different date um, aggregate buckets. Um, if I want to invert that, so give me all users that haven't triggered an event um, uh, uh, in this particular index, then I've got a not operator. If I just want people that have um, uh, performed the visit event um, more than six times for the um, uh, for that particular aggregation bucket, then I have an arrange operator. Um, um, and then um, I've got uh, full Boolean support, so I've got or, XOR, um, and, and there's one other operator in there. Um, but those are nestable, so you can have a tree of n depth, so you can like, you know, have, all right, I want um, users that have um, bought something in the past 30 days that came from um, uh, this ad campaign, and um, they should, uh, um, like the color blue, um, or possibly periwinkle, you know, and you can just, you know, you can do, the, you can go crazy, crazy town. Um, and um, I don't really put limitations on you, you just have to realize, that, I mean, you guys are all smart people, you, um, you, you know, there is a cost to query complexity, and the flatter, the shallower you make the tree, the cheaper it's going to be. Um, and then at the very bottom, I've got my regex, um, example with a regex operator. Basically, it's just um, a convenience method that converts the um, uh, uh, converts that string into a series of um, or and and boolean clauses, which um, uh, gets executed just like any other or or um, and boolean clause um, uh, would be in the tree. Um, right now, the query planner is very naive, so I just sort of I do what the tree tells me to do. Um, but um, there are some optimizations available, like um, for AND clauses, uh, it matter, you can get some optimizations depending on size of individual indexes. So like you wanna, you wanna AND the two smallest indexes, um, two smallest indexes first. That means um, because if, a bit can only be, uh, can, can come through an AND expression if it's set in all the different indexes. So if you look at the smallest two, and you get those results, well, I don't have to look at the, the, all this giant, you know, tail of these larger indexes because I know that none of these other bits are set, so it can't make it through, and so, you know. Anyway, I'm rambling. Um, uh, results so far. So, um, so this is just on my laptop uh, for an eight clause query for four billion rows is less than two seconds. Um, and you know, that goes up, you know, and that's single threaded by the way. Um, so it gets better with multi-threaded because all of this is inherently parallel. Um, and I haven't even started to use the, um, uh, 
the fancy CPU instructions yet. Right now I'm just using 64-bit ints. So um, um, there's fancy hardware support for vectors in SSS3, so I can start doing parallel uh, loading and, ex uh, and bitwise operations on chunks of 512 bytes. So this will get much faster. You know, and then it goes to, all right, you know, we compared this byte of chunk of index in like seven CPU cycles, you know, and I've get billions of CPU cycles per sec and per core, and I've got 32 cores in my box. You guys do the math. So um, uh, I've got full regular expression support, full support for range queries, the ability to index any numeric value, um, 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 and that includes, um, uh, all values that can be hashed. Um, so um, let's say you just, you don't care about regular expressions for a particular string value. Let's say it was, um, you know, um, browser agent, you know, that's a good one. I don't need to perform regex on a browser agent. I just need um, a hash. And so that would just be run through a hash. It means your index gets to be much smaller and your queries get sped up. Um, um, what isn't finished yet, um, and this is going to be done in, in version one. So version one is due to go, you know, limited live um, by the end of this month. So this stuff will be done within the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, but support for atomic counters. Um, so I'll be able to index whatever counter you guys, counter fields you guys are storing in Cassandra. Um, group by query aggregation. So um, give me cohort analysis or funnel reports for you know revenue based off of. Um, uh, ad campaign hits. Um, and we're still working on some of the event processing and distribution, but, you know, that's, you know, we're, I, mean, I just, before this, I came from the React core people and, like, you know, we were hashing out how we're going to do some of this stuff, but it, this is all an active development. All of this is going to be in place for version one. Um, like I said, it's all open source. Um, so we're doing, um, uh, I've created its own org, Project Z. I, I'm not very good at thinking about names. Project X was already taken, so, <laughs> you know. Um, and then within that, um, it's being broken out into several sub-projects. Um, uh, Mutton is the core library. That's the only thing that's public right now. Um, but the, the, all the event processing stuff um, is called Sourdough, and that's also going to be made public. Um, and uh, some of the Lua stuff um, is called the Chuga. Um, which is Spanish for lettuce. Um, if you haven't noticed already, we have a sandwich theme going. Um, but, uh, oop. Ah, all right, so that's my spam trap and um, my Twitter handle. Um, so you guys feel free to email me or reach out to me on Twitter. Um, email's probably best. Um, I'm not with it, you know, all those fancy kids and their newfangled social stuff. But, um, uh, we've seen a lot of interest from other companies, but uh, right now just the core contributors are at Kissmetrics. But um, if you want to hop in, provide use cases, provide test cases, provide, you know, whatever, it, you know, I'm not going to turn down help. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, so we've got like a shit ton of time for questions, so have at it. So we have, um, right now we're doing locking on each individual um, uh, index, um, 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 but I'm probably going to move that to each individual slice um, uh, because, and um, that could actually be moved down to each segment if, you know, if I wanted to. Um, but, um, and I'm also doing tiered locking, so um, I've got a read lock and a write lock. So multiple reads can happen, um, but only one write can happen. Um, and really, it, the the problem is that um, a segment is only a, each segment is its own little chunk, and you have to make sure that you don't have multiple chunks um, overriding it. Um, uh, but yeah, it's I mean it's you can't it could possibly be done lockless, but then you're adding a lot more complexity. Um, I just I've gotten it to as small as it can, and I'm doing it all in C++. I've got a lot of experience doing 
um, high performance, um, uh, uh, multi-threaded stuff in C++. So, yeah. I mean, it, did I answer your question? So it's fundamentally serialized at the index level. Yeah. Well, it's right now it's at the index level, but it could go down to the individual segment, and and because the segment right now is the smallest unit of operation. Um, um, The thing is, it's, it's really dependent on your distribution of data. So, um, you know, if you have, if you have one um, bucket or shard or whatever you want to call it, or, um, or you have one really hot customer, then it could, um, you could have some write contention if they're all writing to the same counter a lot. Um, and they all happen to be in a, uh, and all the users happen to be in a very tight distribution, then you could get some lock contention. But if you have a, a widespread of data coming from different customers um, or uh, different users um, um, or different events, then you're not going to see that issue. Um, uh, In the C++ right now, no, um, just because, um, so I've seen, I've done a lot of this like parachute, Matt in, do performance analysis, fix all of our problems sort of things, and really like if you do a lot of that stuff up front, then you end up optimizing the wrong stuff. And so, um, and a lot of this is very use case dependent. Um, uh, so my data is going to be different than your data. My distribution of data is going to be different than your distribution of data. My update. So all of that's um, different. So what I'm looking to do is to collect use cases and data, and then I'll go through and make optimizations. I've I've left it open um, uh, uh, where I know there could possibly be issues. Locking being one, um, the CP, different CPU instructions being another. Um, uh, the way some of the data is outlaid in memory, um, uh, where optimizations could fit in if the need arises. So it's not like this is, we're, you're not locked into anything, you're not fucked if you decide you want to like, you know, use this. Um, and then also because you're processing events asynchronously, you can always allow events to back up into the queue a little bit. Um, uh, and you'll have like a soft real, it won't necessarily be true real time, but it'll be soft real time of like, you know, events coming into the system might live in the queue for a couple hundred milliseconds um, to wait before they're, they're um, actually committed. And then we also answer um, queries uh, preferentially to um, committing new data because the queries are representing actual user computer interaction, so you want that to be snappy, whereas, you know, an event coming into the system, if it waits 100, an extra 100 milliseconds, no big deal. So, yeah. This, this looks exactly like uh, Lucene, right? So, Same idea. Uh, so why didn't you guys use, like, something like SolarOS or Elasticsearch? Well, yeah, so um, the problem is that we've got too much data. So we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of data. Um, and... Um, I mean, you could use loose. I mean, you could do some of the um, same ideas and use Lucene to do the bitmap stuff. But um, you know, I've got higher performance um, stuff on the back end um, already um, than Lucene's capable of doing. Um, yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's. It's not that. I mean, I make it. Bitmaps indexes seem very complicated. It's not that complicated. Um, uh, so, um, a lot of it's having to do with, like, the event dispatching and the, um, the writing through to Cassandra and, um, uh, some of the regex, uh, finite autonomous stuff, but, um, Lucene wouldn't have gotten me a whole lot. And I'd have to sit, I'd have to live in the JVM, um, and so the... Yeah, it's that terabytes is a rounding error for me. So, I mean, like, you know, we're literally, we're consuming, you know, m more than, or we're in the hundreds of millions of events per day, um, and that's going up very, very quickly. 
because um, we've sort of reached that nice inflection hockey stick curve that every company hopes to get to. And um, uh, it's just a lot of data. It's, I mean, it, if we were talking about tens of terabytes, then yeah, I would have done it. Because I've actually run you know, solar on top of Cassandra and dealt with that scenario where I'm dealing with tens of terabytes of data. Um, uh, but it's reached a scale where it wasn't possible anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, let's get him. All right. No, um, because the, the data is actually stored in the, um, so the mutton and the, um, the query tier actually stores its own copy of the data and it writes through to Cassandra um, so that um, you can be accessed from um, uh, Hadoop and uh, all the other tools. And also it's the, if all of the clustering stuff that we wrote absolutely catastrophically fails, we can reconstruct it from Cassandra, but none of the live data is, or live queries are stored from Cassandra. Um, we're actually using level DB on the individual query nodes so that we have a local copy. And then we actually keep all of the indexes resident in memory. That's another reason why we use C++ over Java, is that we have, you know, it's not a big deal in C++ for me to consume 200 gigabytes of memory and like you know I can just load up a box with 256 gigs dedicate 200 of that just to this one process no big deal but in Java you can't do that so um, yeah yeah and I'd have to deal with lots of you know back and forth network traffic and right. which would pretty much make this untenable yeah um, more um, Guy in red, and then we'll come back to you just because you've already asked one. All right. It can be all over the place. Um, so we've had some bad customers that want to shove entire stack traces through as an event. Um, uh, we'd have a tendency to get angry with those individuals. Um, uh, but um, it could be something as simple as, you know, this page was viewed. Um, and it or it could be, you know, this video name was viewed, um, and this is the user's ID and some other uh, stuff. So really, it could go from a couple of bytes to, um, let's say, two. I don't know, probably like the average larger event is probably like two or three k. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got, in addition to field names, we've got um, uh, a bucket. So um, all fields are indexes, um, can be namespaced by a bucket. And in that instance, it's our customer's product ID. Um, so that's how we get it. So we have two levels of hierarchy. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as long as it can, you know, uh, grab the lock, it's going to update it, and so much quicker. Um, I don't have to worry about, you know, um, there's a lot less complexity. Um, and, you know, as long as there are free cycles and we're not answering queries, which for the most part you're not, like, you know, yeah. customers aren't hitting you, like, you know, thousands of queries per second. Um, uh, well, an individual user won't be hitting you with thousands of yeah. queries per second. Um, so most of the time, the locks are going to be free to, to answer write traffic. Um, and uh, read is actually going to be a very small percentage of your overall value. So let's go back to you. And so in a lot of BitMap implementations, the, the bit index is actually the direct offset to the row. But I think you showed a hash of the keys. Do, do you have another secondary index under this for every bit position, the actual keys? No, um, because I just store it in regular offsets of like 256 bytes or 512 bytes. And so from that, I can just do the math and know, all right, 
if this segment were to exist, this is the column that it would exist in. And so I'll ask for that column. Um, if it exists, then I get back fine. If it doesn't, then I assume it doesn't exist. And then I'll just create an empty segment to set the bit and then persist it to the, the data stores. Oh, so the, the, the field, let's say, uh, all right, so I have a bucket called bucket foo, a field um, called um, field bar, right? And so that'll be concatenated as the first chunk of my row key. And then um, let's say I'm indexing value one, then um, uh, it'll be underscore, then the byte value that I'm, that's being indexed, which is 128 bit int, and then, um, uh, Within that, I'll have the individual columns, which represent the segments um, that um, uh, for the actual rows. Um, it's sort of hard to do it with my hands. Um, if you want, I can I can sketch it out for you, and we can go through it because I. But, you know. but essentially, there's another. After you collapse the bit, then you have to go through each bit. So yeah, each segment, and the segment being 512 bytes, and each segment, you know, in Cassandra is a column um, or a bucket in level DB. Yeah. Yes, one bit always maps back to a single row, not necessarily a user, but a row. Oh, so to, how do you invert that? Yes. Okay. All right. I totally get. It. Yes. It's. I just have another index that maps the 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 hash value or the row position back to the actual row key to, uh, to reverse it. Um, uh, so yeah, I didn't show that. It is possible to have a collision, um, but um, uh, with a 128-bit hash, uh, a collision is very rare. And so, what I'll do is um, um, I'll just store those. I'll, I'll store those two values for the hash value. Uh, so the two row keys for that hash position, and then I'll just do the candidate check on both of those to make sure it actually works. Any more? All right. I think I've turned into a pumpkin. So. All right. Thank you.